This week on the Legion podcast, we're going to be discussing competition and how frequently it's appropriate to compete and how some people can compete too little, some people can compete too much. Like most things, there's sort of a sweet spot in the middle. And in particular, we wanted to start today with people actually competing too little, right? This is something that I see in some athletes who I coach. Um, you know, not going to necessarily call them out publicly, but if you're listening, you know who you are. Um, who don't actually. If you were do, listening to uh, the the pre-record, you'll you'll hear all the names. <laughs> and if we recorded that, we'll release like a bonus track of just all the names that Todd listed. Yeah, for Patreon including- subscribers only. <laughs> <laughs> 30 second rants on each of his athletes that does this yeah totally <laughs> um but yeah the idea is that that competition itself is a skill that people need to be exposed to and not just that but also getting the feedback of where you sit relative to other athletes is extremely important for people who do want to push themselves in the sport right that People often have misconceptions about where they sit relative to the field, about things that they're good at, things that they're bad at. And once you actually start competing, you very quickly figure out what the expectations are, where the field is on certain things, you know, things that you thought were a weakness for you, you realize, oh, actually, I'm pretty good at that. Um, Other things that you think are strengths, you're like, wow, how did someone lift that much more than me? I thought I was pretty strong for this sport. Um, And just the exposure and the feedback allows people to kind of iterate on what they're working on to improve their training and to focus in on specific things. So that's something that I see with some frequency is people who are like a little bit hesitant to get out there and expose themselves. And, you know, I see some of the problems that comes from that, especially for people who do maybe not have like super serious competitive ambitions, but who do actually want to participate in the sport. And I'd like to see some of those folks compete more. So John, what do you think? Yeah, I think I often see it from people who, have these goals of, yeah, I want to get to the games or I want to get to semifinals. And because they're so focused on that game season and all the steps that lead up to it, the only time they really compete is at those times. You know, they'll do the open and if they get through, they'll do the next round. Um, But the rest of the year, their sole focus is on that and they don't think that they should be doing other things that not necessarily interfere, but are not directly related to that goal. Not realizing that, of course, the experience and and act of competing and getting on the floor against other people and seeing how you stack up is actually a key part to that main goal that they have. I think a lot of people will just assume that what they do in training is directly going to be replicated in competition. Um, and I think for everyone who's done a live competition knows the difference on the floor when you have the adrenaline, when you have people cheering or you have someone next to you who's pushing you that little bit more. Um, it's a much different experience to doing a workout against your friends in the gym. Um, and your body reacts differently and your pacing strategies can go out the window if you're not prepared for it. Um, and you don't know how to react. And I think without those experiences without that feeling of live competition without that adrenaline rush without the nerves before a workout it's very hard to then do well at a competition if you're not sure how that's going to affect you see i think it's the equivalent of not warming up before a workout you know you go into a workout without warming up it's like yeah it's going to hit you pretty hard pretty fast you go in warmed up and well prepared the workout's going to be a little bit easier and i think that's the same with live competition if you if you've done live competitions and you kind of know what it feels like, it's easier. If you just jump right into one, that first one's always going to be tough. Yeah, I think it's it's a matter of building up the the reference experiences, right? That sort of like you're saying, if you're if you're not expecting the way that you feel when you're super jacked up at a live event, then yeah, everything can completely fall apart, right? Whatever pacing strategy you had is gone. You know, you don't know what it feels like to use some weird pull-up bar that's the wrong height you know you don't know what it feels like to actually be on the floor with people who are better than you who are beating you and you're like oh wow i'm usually i'm usually the one who's good what's going on here Uh uh-huh and so having those reference experiences i think is extremely valuable and if you don't have that the you know or, or you're not used to it um it becomes very difficult to actually perform at the level that you're capable of and what you're saying there about pull up bars like 
I had the issue coaching our team for the games last year. Like I'd make them do a workout and they'd be like, Oh, I want to go on this bar. And it's like, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. like you don't get to pick your bar at the games. You don't get to have the spiel bar that you always use. It's the perfect height off the ground for you. You know, it's just use this one. It's a, it's not a spiel bar. It's different grip to the one you like. It's different height that you have to jump to more. It's like, yeah, you need to be okay with doing that and not have it affect you. Yeah, the uh, the 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 seeming inability of people to do anything on not their favorite double taped spiel bar is like, give me a break, come on, you got to be able, you got to be able and to figure this out. Also, the lack of athletic awareness to be like, oh yeah, the bar is six inches above you and you have to jump to it. I can't reach that. Yeah, you can jump. I've, I've seen <laughs> you work out. I know you can jump. Let's relax a little bit. <laughs> Um, but I, I think that a, a good way to frame it, right, is that we ha we have to teach the skill of improvisation. You know, the the ability to compete well is the ability to improvise based upon the equipment that's available, based upon the event that is happening, based upon the competitors around you, based upon what the judge is telling you or not telling you. You know, based upon the adrenaline of the competition, you have to be able to take all that stuff in and react to it, and then create something good on the fly based upon the constraints that you're given. And, you know, that that skill in and of itself is not necessarily happening in the gym, right? That, you know, you get your training sent to you. Um, and even if it's something that catches you by surprise in training, you know, it's a it's a totally different scenario when you're comfortable. And it's a totally different scenario when, you know, you had the workout ahead of time and you um, it's a progression from last week. You're like, okay, yeah, this week I'm doing three minutes on one minute off. Last week it was, you know, 2.30 on 90 seconds off. So I know I can probably pace here. It's like, no, 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 no. We, we have to be able to improvise in um, a variety of adverse scenarios. And the only way you do that is by creating those scenarios uh, through some form of competition that's out of your control. And I think outside of that as well, the, the idea of comparison and knowing where you stack up to other people um, if you're working out with the same people in your gym, you know, like, you know, your strengths, their strengths, you know, what workouts you can beat them on. Um, it doesn't give you a clear indicator of how you stack up to the rest of the world. And if your goal is to go to a, go to the games or go to a big competition and qualify for it, you need to make sure that what you're doing in the gym is going to get you there. And sometimes smaller competitions or more frequent competitions is going to allow you to see how you stack up. You know, if you're going to a local competition and you're finishing seventh every time, okay, you're probably not going to be making it to semifinals this year. But until you go and do that, you don't know necessarily where you stack up. You just know how you did in the Open last year. Yeah, I PR'd my back squat two weeks ago. I'm doing well. I PR'd my unbroken ring muscle-ups, but you're still not making the progress relative to the rest of the field. That you need to and competitions are a way to get some of that understanding and see where you stack up um even even just uh online qualifiers can be helpful with that as well um obviously most of the medium to big competitions have an online qualifier now and even if you don't want to go do the live competition doing the online qualifier just seeing where you stack up can be useful seeing which workouts you do better in which ones you do worse in um, where you need to focus more effort in your training um, can be can be useful for you and for your coach. Yeah, I think that the um, the the tricky balance to find here is you know I mean we've talked before about the negative aspects of comparison and I think that a lot of people who are somewhat competitive in a sport like CrossFit are people who are hard on themselves and who potentially feed into you know too much comparison with other people and wanting to get good results all the time. And that can be very, very negative for people's psychology. So I empathize with people who are kind of in like a weird middle ground between wanting to compete or not compete. 
and being like, you know what, this just isn't actually healthy for me. Like, I don't want to do the Wadapalooza qualifiers. I don't want to try to go to this competition because it just makes me feel like shit. And this is my hobby that I'm kind of good at. And I'm good enough at that I'm in sort of like a weird in between spot where I feel like I should compete, but like maybe I don't actually want to. So, like, I get that. And I don't think that those people need to be like, yes, let me rank myself constantly and turn my hobby into something that I hate doing. Right. Like, Fine. Um, but all that said, John, to, to your point, right? Like if you are seriously trying to say, you know what, I do want to go to semifinals. I do want to be on a team that can compete at a higher level, whatever, right? You need to get at least some consistent feedback about where you sit on certain things. Because again, I think I said this in the intro, but people are just wrong a lot of the time about where their abilities are in both positive and negative directions. They just don't know. You know, that 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 they feel like something is hard for them, or they feel like they're not making progress on something. Um, or they're like, Oh yeah, cool, I have that kind of workout in the bag. And they just they just don't have the feedback from people who are at the level that they want to be at to understand like what they actually need to work on and where they need to focus in on stuff, right? And there's also just a lot of little things that people pick up from competing, from being around other high-level competitors that it's very difficult to to teach someone, right? You're not just going to like write in their training program, okay, make sure that, you know, you like develop this exact intuition for how you should pace something or like make sure that, you know, when you're racing someone that you are aware of where they are, but don't let it disrupt your plan too much. Like, like that's not going to come across in training. notes. that's going to come across from actually being in scenarios where those things have to come into play and you can sort of see other people doing them well and just uh, uh, subconsciously absorb the tactics and the strategies that those better athletes utilize. Yeah. And I think, you know, that, like you say, that comparison can be negative, but um, I've seen it too often where people don't compare themselves because they're scared of that. And yeah. it just, you know, it kind of leads you into a blind alley of, of not knowing your ability. And if, if you're doing this to be competitive, if you're, if you're doing it to do competitions, you do need that, an element. And it's, say, it's not the, it's not the day to day of, oh, they just PR their power clean. I haven't PR, PR my power clean in like months. It's looking at the big picture of it all and being able to compare yourself on a controlled, tested environment. Um, and then I think we should probably talk on the other side of that as well, about the people that compete too much, who think that doing more competitions is always going to be better. Because um, like you said yeah, at the beginning, it's a balance. Too. You know, I, I see some people who they'll... They do an online qualifier, two weekends time, they have a live competition. The week after it, they're doing another online qualifier and they never really train. They never really get in kind of uninterrupted training cycles to improve themselves. They're just on this constant competing cycle and kick, um, which I mean, I, I think that's worse than not competing. Yeah, probably. I mean, it depends on the athlete, right? Right. But I, th I think people need dedicated like blocks of training where they are working on improving things and the nature of live competition and qualifiers, um, not even from like a muscular standpoint, but just like a nervous system and, you know, brain function and all this kind of thing. Like you need time to, you need downtime after competitions. You need, you need to kind of relax and let your body reset and all this kind of thing. And it's, some people just never let themselves do that. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, uh, you know, I, I, I was going to say as sort of like a counterpoint, there do seem to be some people that just thrive on always competing and they just kind of like follow a chaotic, disorganized training plan and are just always throwing stuff in and they're very talented and they seem to just be able to do it and get better. Mm -hmm. Um, so I can think of sort of like counter examples, but, I think that those but you are, say get better, like I. There may be putting up better results in each each competition, but it doesn't necessarily mean they've optimized their ability. Totally, yeah. Um, it's 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 yeah. I mean, it's I, not necessarily the best for them, but they can still tolerate right. it and do well. Right. 
because yeah, I can I can think of people who do that, and you know their gradual standing does increase each time. But you know, okay, if you stepped away for two months without doing a competition, are you going to be better than you would have if you did these other three competitions in that time period? Um, I just I I don't think it's optimal for anyone. I think some people are more tolerant to it and will come out of it better, but I don't think it's the optimal way for anyone to improve. Yeah. And I, and I do think it's, um, it also depends on why people are doing it, you know, cause I think some people yeah. are doing it out of like a, a sort of neuroticism of like, I just need to, to do all this stuff and I need to constantly check in and see where I'm at. Um, and then, then it comes from like a, a negative place. And I think other people are just like way more chill and kind of like loosey goosey with their training and like what competitions they do. And they're just like, yeah, sick. Oh, I'll do this workout. Like, oh, that one looks fun. Yeah. I'd like to go to Miami in the winter. Maybe I'll try this. And it's like, there's just not a lot of, um, I mean, anything attached to it. So to them, it's just another training session and they're good enough that they can do well. Um, so I do think that that's kind of the avatar of a person who can get away with it. But John, to your point, I do think that the um, idea of just having like ups and downs in training as a whole is really, really important. And if you don't actually get off that that qualifier cycle for a while, that that can be, um, you know, m much, much less than optimal, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you look at every other sport, they always have an off season. They always have time where they're focused on either resting or working to improve um, that doesn't involve competition and doesn't involve that cycle of competition. And that's, and that's where I think it really gets, can get um, a little bad because, you know, people will, they'll, they, they'll do a competition. They'll think, oh, I'll take a couple of days off. I'll get back into training. And then 10 days later, they're doing an online qualifier. And they've just about recovered from the previous competition. They've kind of got one or two good training days in. And then they're thinking about, oh, okay, I'm going to take today off because I'm doing a qualifier tomorrow. And then do a qualifier. Maybe they repeat that workout. Then again, they've got like, you know, six days of downtime. And then they're doing another qualifier or another live competition. Um, and it's just a constant cycle of, you know, building up, dropping back down you know, frying your CNS, letting it recover, having those adrenaline spikes, letting your body recover from that, um, trying to get your lingering shoulder issue that you have from doing too many competitions, let that rest. Um, you know, there's just, it's very cyclical in nature. And the fact that you can probably do a competition every weekend in the year, if you wanted to, without traveling too far. Like there are enough big competitions and small local competitions around that you could do it every week if you wanted to. There's no dedicated off season. Um, and I think that's where it can get dangerous for some people. If they want to improve, if they just enjoy competing and, and don't care about improving every time, then that's okay. If they're trying yeah, to right. Cause I mean, yeah, to them, it might just be like an intramural sport. It's like, yeah, cool. Like I'm on right. the, I'm on the, the dorm soccer team and we play every Tuesday, like I'm, I play yeah. CrossFit every weekend. Like, I don't care. You know, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. That can be okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I do, th I do think that the, the other thing that you're sort of hinting at is that in going through this cycle of competing, um, again, some people can sort of tolerate it and do reasonably well. But I think one of the issues that can come up with that is that the type of work that you're doing to compete is not necessarily the type of work that's like the long-term thing that you need to work on, right? And this is something that's, mm -hmm. that's always a little bit of a challenge with athletes in general is that um, people don't always have a great model for like what they need to work on and what's okay to get worse and what they need to actually see get better. Right. So we've talked about this on plenty of other podcasts where if you don't do very CrossFit y things for a while, you can get dramatically worse at CrossFit, but not actually lose a lot of quote unquote fitness. Right. If you're like, okay, we're going to take a step back from thrusters and chest to bar pull ups, 
and you kind of don't do those for a while, and then you do something with a lot of thrusters and chest bar pull ups, it's often disastrous. You're like, oh my God, like my fitness is completely tanked. But that may not be true. You just have lost that sort of like short term adaptation to those specific movement patterns and the like really, really nasty uh, like metabolic consequence of doing that stuff quickly back to back. And we don't want to lose that too much, right? We definitely talked about that in other podcasts where people pull way, way too far back and they're like, sick, we're just doing like band pull aparts and biker intervals. And then once we do thrusters and pull ups again, we're going to be awesome. It's like, no, you're not. Um, but that said, you know, if you, if you are trying to improve something more like uh, running volume, back squat strength, um, like specific shoulder issues, whatever, like maybe you do need to take a step back from, um, you know, thrusters and chest to bar pull ups, and you will see very consequential um, diminishing of your abilities in those movements. But that might be okay, right? That that's something that we can say. You know what? For this eight week training period, we're going to lose that adaptation to doing quote unquote CrossFit, and we're going to lose that on purpose because we know that that's not necessarily the most important thing for you right now, and we can get that back later, right? Um, and so that that I think is what the the actual discussion around like competing too much, you know, that's really where it starts to get sticky. Is like we need to take away some of this sport specific training in order to work on something else, and we're doing it deliberately. We're not doing it in a way that's like too central planning, like weird corrective exercise focused, but we are doing it in a way that is somewhat thought through. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think the issue of rest, I feel like we've talked about it before. Um, some people are very good at self-regulating and knowing when they need time off and knowing when they need recovery time. Other people will see a bad training session and they'll just think they have to work harder. They won't take a step back and think, okay, maybe I just need a couple of days off. Um, and I think when it comes to competition, People think, oh, it's, it was an easier competition. The volume wasn't too high. The loading wasn't too high. It was just a normal training day. Um, and they'll get right back into training. And I think knowing the difference between a training stimulus and a competition stimulus is important for people. Knowing the difference in the kind of recovery you need post-competition compared to post-training. Um, because again, once you get into the whole adrenaline, cortisol, all the all the things that are kicking in based around stress of competition, um, they need addressing. And that's not just, a, oh, my muscles feel fine, I can work out. That's a time away from the gym, decompress, relax, do something that you enjoy that isn't exercise um, or is not intense exercise, let's say. Um, I think people often miss that part of it and they don't anticipate the amount of recovery they need following something like that. Um, you know, you look at some games athletes, they'll take two, three, four weeks before they get back in the gym after the games. And not to say they're not active in that time, but they're not doing CrossFit. And they're taking time away from being in the gym working hard. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that what you're starting to get at there is is really really important, right? That the the fatigue of competition isn't necessarily just like literally how tired you feel the next day or like how sore your muscles may be. You know, that when we think about the cumulative fatigue of doing a very stressful thing like a competition, right? Even if it went well for you, it's it's very very stressful. Um we start to see issues pop up for people after doing competitions and it, it and, and what it is it's not necessarily like oh yeah you're tight like your your muscles are literally tired like yes that can happen but it's more of the the global fatigue and what starts to starts to occur for people is that the skill of making micro adjustments like whether that's on a movement right like okay i caught the snatch a little weird so i need to like make a little shift in my shoulder or you know 
on like a subconscious level, my regulation of my metabolic processes during this difficult training session, or like all these micro adjustments that we don't necessarily think about that are a key part of actually doing training, like that stuff starts to get iffy if you are too fatigued, right? That people start to struggle with making micro adjustments to their technique which then potentially puts them at a greater risk for injury. Actually, most of the time when people are like, oh, you got to be careful doing that, you're going to get injured. I'm like, well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Like injury isn't just as straightforward as blah, 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 blah. In this case, I actually do think this is something where people underweight the risk of injury after going through a significantly stressful and fatiguing um, type of situation, whether that's a competition or you know even just like life stuff. You know, that the the micro adjustments necessary to protect yourself from being in positions that you aren't uh, strong in, like the ability to do that goes way, way, way down the more fatigued you are. And so this is why a lot of um, professional sports organizations are so deliberate about load management, right? Like why are they so specific about tracking the uh, the GPS data for their players? You know, why are they so specific about pitch count and stuff like that? And, you know, th- they'll make pretty hard decisions that sort of, um, that don't seem to make any sense. It's like, well, why'd you take the pitcher out? Like he's killing it. It's like, because we know that if they throw more than this amount of pitches in this amount of time, that like the likelihood of them needing UCL surgery in the next six months like goes way, way, way up. And it's not a, it's not a perfect one-to-one relationship, right? There's exceptions on either side of that. But just being aware of load management as a concept and the idea that these, these specific competitive events like spike the load, even if it doesn't feel that bad, I think is really, really important for people. And like you said, John, may, may impact their their actual understanding of the benefit of saying, hey, you know what? Like it is actually important for me to take some time and pull back a little bit after I did this series of competitions, that this will be long-term beneficial for me in terms of my um, overall stress load, the likelihood of me getting injured in the gym, um, actually recovering properly from doing an intense stressful competition such that I can improve based upon that rather than just like jamming me further and further down into the uh, uh, the fatigue spiral. You know, all that stuff I think is underrated. I agree. So what can people do? That's the thing. What can they do to make sure they're managing that stress and volume appropriately, whether it's coming off of a competition or just generally from life? What What do you kind of advise athletes when you're coaching them for that? Everyone needs a whoop. Duh! <laughs> Everyone needs a whoop. Um, oh, whoop. <laughs> my whoop is my whoop is crazy. <laughs> yeah, I, I think Monday night, Monday night, I got the most sleep I've got in the last month to six weeks, and said my recovery was twenty percent. It was just you can't do that to me. I got. I work so hard to get to bed early and then you're telling me I'm 20% recovered. It's ridiculous. John, you have adrenal fatigue. This is, we know this. <laughs> Did your whoop, your yeah. whoop is sending out the bat signal to all naturopaths in Denver. It's like, please give this man some adrenal support. <laughs> I did get some sage in the mail the next day, so maybe yeah, maybe ship, that's him, what it was. ship him some herbs. <laughs> 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 um, but actually, I mean, seriously, I I do think you know we've we've ragged on some of the wearables and stuff in the past, but I do think something like a whoop can be helpful for certain people in this kind of situation because they may not recognize um, the difference between how they think they feel and what's actually going on. Right. And like all the issues with um, commercial HRV tracking aside, sometimes someone being like, oh, it seems like I'm fine. I actually feel less sore than I expected. My stupid wristband tells me that I shouldn't go to the gym today. Like, interesting. I wonder why that is. And it's like, oh, yeah, like I did this competition recently. You know, like I got fired from my job and I feel terrible. Like, it's like, yeah, that stuff actually matters. So I do think there is value in that. Um, but, you know, in, in, in terms of like, specific tactical stuff for people to work on. Um, I think that one of the things that that you started to say earlier, which is again, not like a very specific, oh, here's one quick trick or whatever. It's that people who do well with this kind of thing have a really good intuition for understanding how they feel and are not super, super attached to what they're doing on any given day. 
right? And that's like the long-term goal is to be able to develop that intuition where it's like, you know what? Like, I just don't feel so good today. We're just going to skip this session. Or like, I'm going to modify this and I'm going to do something a little bit different based upon how I feel. Or I actually feel fantastic today. Today is a good day for me to do extra work. You know, the, 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 the skill of improvising is applicable not just to competing, but is applicable to, to training on a given day as well. And developing that is difficult. Right, it's something that comes from the reference experiences of having done a bunch of competitions, of having made some of these mistakes, of being like, "Oh yeah, I feel good after this competition. Like, let me just go into the gym the next day and train. Like, I'm not super sore. Everything's fine." And then you're like, "Oh wow, I like completely tweaked my hip flexor. That's weird. I thought I felt fine. It's like, yeah, you felt fine, but you didn't recognize the potential things that could go wrong based upon your past reference experiences. Now you know." Now, you know, like don't go into the gym and do a bunch of pistols the day after you did a hard competition. Like, yeah, you might tweak your hip flexor. Okay, cool. Like we know that now. Um, So, you know, uh, again, a lot of the stuff that we talk about isn't like the five quick tips. It's like, hey, you have to have all these reference experiences and build up this nuanced skill of not just physical performance, but intuition about your physical performance, which is a very unsatisfying answer, I think. Yeah. So basically you're, you're telling people that they should maybe do more competitions, but they should also maybe do less. Yeah. It really, do. it's okay. hard to say. Okay. <laughs> Flip a coin. Flip it's a coin. definitely a theme of our podcast. <laughs> and I would say we're very good at sitting on the fence. Yes. Yeah. Totally. Chesterton's fence. Sitting on Chesterton's fence. Oh. I don't understand the reference. Oh, it's a... Uh, like a well-known political allegory um, often deployed for like conservative positions, which is if you come across a fence sitting or if you come across a fence um, in the middle of the woods and you're not sure why the fence is there, uh, don't take it down until you understand why it exists. Do you mean Chesterfield? Like you want to sit on a Chesterfield? I don't understand this British slang. I'm confused. That's a, that's a little uh, insight into our knowledge base there. <laughs> now, you, you have to explain your reference. No, I, don't, I actually don't know what a, you're A Chesterfield about. is a piece of furniture. Okay. Tom. So you come in with uh, you know, philosophical quandaries, <laughs> and I come in with furniture-based reference points. So. Okay, but what kind of furniture even is it? Um, Chessfield. I honestly couldn't tell you off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> You've really made me doubt myself. <laughs> Hard to say. <laughs> Something that one can. My sit initial on. thought. I, I initially thought it was like a like a chaise long. If you're yeah, a, sure, like a fainting couch or something. You're like yeah, yeah. I'll have a seat now, on the Chesterfield. Yeah, okay. But but now I have a feeling it might be like a chest of drawers. Uh, okay, we're going to do a little bit of Googling uh, yeah. on the podcast. Chesterfield. Okay, yeah, it's like a, it's like a couch. Uh, okay. Sure. Seemingly a, a kind of leather-backed, uh, not too high, doesn't look too comfy kind of couch. <laughs> So you're not buying one right now? No. No. Furniture is back ordered for months anyway. You won't get it until 2023. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I I honestly don't think a Chesterfield would balance that well on a fence. It looks kind of yeah. it's kind of chunky. But, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a there's a massive Chesterfield shortage currently. They're all sitting in a uh, um Un, un, unaccessible, inaccessible shipping containers in ports in Los Angeles right now. Can't get them out. Yeah. So, yeah. It doesn't matter. It's a moot point. <laughs> um, but yeah, maybe, maybe you should try to, to give some more specific advice to people, right? So, let's say for people who actually seriously want to compete, right? With all the caveats and whinging about, you know, not wanting people to put themselves in psychologically uncomfortable positions if their serious goal isn't competition. If your goal is competition, you need to be exposing yourself 
to competitive environments with some frequency, right? That's probably a few in-person competitions per year, and that's potentially a few online qualifiers other than the open quarterfinal, whatever process that is the major game season, right? The error that I see there is I think people are afraid of exposing themselves early and they think that they can button everything up and get themselves to the point that they're ready and then just suddenly show up and be like, now I'm ready. Here I am. I have now qualified. Everything is good, right? And that's a serious mistake because part of the process of getting yourself to that point is developing the skill of competition and sort of like you were saying before, putting yourself in spots where you are in fact exposed and you do realize like, oh, okay, like I'm not there yet on X, Y, Z. This is what I need to focus on, right? So I think that that's the advice for that avatar of a person. And then the other person, sort of like we talked about before, you know, that's the person who competes too much. I gave some fake answer about needing a whoop and developing a intuition about their performance. What do you think for that person, John? Yeah, I mean, I think... It is tough to generalize for that, um, but I think using performance metrics within competitions for those people can be useful. Um, you know, if you're seeing a steady decrease in your placing in competitions or, you know, you're suddenly someone who you beat two months ago is beating you in competitions, that's, you know, maybe a sign that you need to take a step back and either get some rest or do some training or both. Or get some sauce. So when you start saucing. Yes. Yeah. If in doubt, <laughs> PEDs to, to make that next step. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I think for, for the serious athlete, they should be doing, not including the open, they should be doing three to four competitions a year. Um, and maybe that, you know, that would include semifinals or the games. You know, if someone, if someone does the open, quarterfinals, semifinals and games, doing another four competitions in a year is potentially too much. Um, you know, you've got that window from the games being, what, well, beginning of August, end of July, whatever it was, um, and then a little bit of downtime, and then you've got the Open again in six, seven months' time. You don't want to be cramming in competitions in that time. But if you do the Open and then maybe you do quarterfinals and nothing else, it's like, okay, we're going to try and fit three or four more competitions across the year the next open starts 